Developing Organ Donation. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which focuses on kidney transplant referral, assessment, and the wait list. We know that th these are topics uh, that are uh, of great interest uh, to you and uh, to many others uh, who will be accessing this uh, webinar uh, in recording mode on our YouTube channel. Uh, so we're very, very uh, pleased to have with us three uh, terrific speakers who will be sharing their expertise uh, with you today. Um, so we have uh, BJ Rialobit, um, and BJ is a nurse and a clinical coordinator in at the kidney um, uh, transplant program here at the Ajmera uh, Transplant Center at UHN. Uh, we've got Andrew Hinson, who is uh, a program manager at the Trillium Gift of Life Network, uh, which is a provincial agency that uh, um, uh, provides oversight uh, in organ donation in Ontario, and he'll be telling you a little bit more about his role. And um, finally, we've got Brian Cook, uh, who is a living kidney donor uh, and a community volunteer, and he will be sharing his story with you later in the webinar. Uh, a reminder that you could submit questions uh, via slido.com and the event code is kidney. So go to slido.com event code kidney to submit your questions as we go through today's presentation. We received quite a few questions in advance, so we'll endeavor to go through those. Um, but if there are others who, that uh, you'd like to see answered first, you can always upvote them um, and we'll try to address um, as many as we can. Uh, so this is the agenda for today's session. Um, we'll start with an overview of kidney transplant. Um, you'll also be hearing more about Trillium Gift of Life Network and its role. Um, the transplant process, uh, what occurs once you're referred to a transplant center, uh, how the evaluation process works for a kidney uh, recipient, and um, everything you ever wanted to do uh, to know about the wait list and more. Uh, so um, without further ado, I, I would like to turn it over to BJ, who will take you through the first part of today's webinar. BJ? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, so in terms of our program at the University Health Network, as some of you may know, it's the oldest uh, transplant program here and largest program here in Canada. Uh, it's been, it was established in 19, um, 1965, and we perform about 600 transplants every year. Um, we do uh, kidney transplants, pancreas, liver, lung, eye transplants, as well as intestinal transplants, and a combination of the above. Um, we currently follow over 5,000 patients in our post-transplant clinic. So it is a very busy, uh, but a very exciting place to be. In terms of the um, chronic kidney disease, um, there are many people who do not know they have uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, based on our, our current statistics, um, year after year, we know that chronic kidney disease is on the rise within Canada and, and, through, and globally. Um, really, uh, in terms of a specialist referral, uh, it is important that a referral does come to us by either your family doctor or your primary nephrologist. Um, and we do have resources on kidneywise.ca for any of the referring uh, providers who may need more information about how to access our services here at the University Health Network. It really is important for our patients and their families to know uh, that dialysis is, is not the only treatment option for patients um, who are experiencing end-stage kidney disease. And so today we'll focus largely on kidney transplant as a option uh, for uh, renal replacement therapy. So in terms of uh, the kidney transplant surgery, just to give you a general overview, um, really it is uh, surgically implanting um, a healthy kidney uh, from a donor, either um, deceased or living, uh, in a three to four hour operation. Um, as you can see in this uh, diagram here, uh, the, the kidney is transplanted plus a piece of the donor's artery, vein, and the ureter. The kidneys uh, that uh, you, you are born with typically don't come out or are, are not surgically removed unless there are issues of infection or in terms of uh, space where, you know, your, your native kidneys or the kidneys you were born with were, are too big and we're not actually able to implant um, the transplanted kidney. 
but uh, most patients uh, think that we actually remove one of your kidneys, which is not the case. This will be um, determined uh, with your surgical assessment as part of uh, your kidney transplant workup. In terms of the different pathways to, to kidney transplants, really living donation and deceased donation are really uh, the, the main um, ways patients uh, get a transplant. And so living donation, um, it's a kidney from somebody who is alive. It's somebody who's either related to you or um, not related to you. Uh, it is important to sort of um, address that myth where a patient must be an identical genetic match for a transplant to proceed. The more, majority of transplants we currently do at our center are actually patients who are not genetically uh, related uh, to the recipient. Um, sometimes we're able to conduct a living donor transplant through anonymous donation or alt altruistic donation. Um, and this typically involves shorter wait times in terms of a patient receiving a transplant. Generally, uh, the outcomes of a living donor transplant are really the gold standard and what we try to achieve for the majority of our patients where possible. However, if living donation is not an option uh, for some of our patients, deceased donation is really uh, the main way patients will proceed to transplant. So it's where patients will be waitlisted for an organ um, and, and basically when a suitable donor becomes available based on um, sort of uh, matching criteria and, and sort of wait time uh, data, uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to provide a kidney transplant this way. Um, again, in terms of wait times, we'll talk about it in a couple of slides, um, but it may, be, uh, it may mean that it will take about, you know, anywhere from about five to seven years, depending on a patient's start date uh, of dialysis in terms of when that surgery will occur. So again, deceased donation transplants typically will have longer wait times uh, than patients um, receiving a living uh, donor uh, transplant. In terms of the benefits of a kidney transplant, we just wanted, wanted to review that briefly with the group today. Really, um, a, a transplant allows for restorative uh, renal function, including um, a hormonal and regulatory roles that are not substituted by dialysis. As you may know, your kidneys are really important in terms of controlling things like your hemoglobin levels and your blood pressure. So it is really important uh, that, you know, um, having the benefits of uh, these, these aspects from a kidney transplant is something that can off we can offer to um, our patients. Um, and as many of you who are in attendance today, you might be dealing with um, either potassium restrictions, uh, phosphate restrictions, or um, as well as fluid restrictions in terms of your dietary needs. Um, but basically post-transplant, uh, these restrictions usually fall to the wayside. We obviously want to encourage uh, and, and promote a balanced and healthy diet because there are you know, obviously concerns in the future in terms of um, heart disease, um, increased cholesterol, uh, sort of blood pressure issues that we also need to monitor further. So, but generally um, there are fewer restrictions uh, post-transplant. We hope with a transplant, we're able to offer our patients uh, both uh, an extended life expectancy, so greater survival, as well as the benefit of an improved quality of life. So there are patients, as you know, who may be you know, traveling in uh, to and from hospital to get dialysis three or four times a week or performing treatments daily at home. And we understand um, you know, the challenges that this can have um, for our patients. However, it is important to educate our patients and their families about the potential risks as it relates to transplant. Um, as you may know, there are a number of medications that will be needed to really ensure the survival um, and, and, and optimization of your kidney transplant. And so these medications are not innocent medications. Um, they do come with risk of diabetes, cancer, infection, and osteoporosis. And so those are the things that we will assess during your workup, as well as lifelong to make sure, again, you're as healthy as possible and the kidney transplant will last as long as possible. Thanks, BJ, and uh, thank you uh, to Paula for allowing me to be uh, part of today's webinar. So, 
as uh, Paula mentioned, uh, I am with Trillium Gift of Life Network and TGLN is the, the government of Ontario agency responsible for delivering and coordinate, coordinating organ and tissue donation and transplantation services across the province. Uh, our mission uh, or vision, I should say, is that no Ontario dies on the wait list. Unfortunately, as many of you will be aware, that uh, due to a lack of deceased donor organs, uh, patients who do not have a living donor do have to be placed on, uh, on a wait list and wait for a deceased uh, donor organ. Uh, so much of uh, TGLN's work is focused on increasing the pool of donors uh, and maximizing the number of or organs that we recover from each deceased donor. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the old donor cards we had or uh, with our efforts to encourage people to register uh, to be a donor through be a, a donor.ca. Um, and a lot of the work that we do does focus on those areas. And, but although TGLN is not directly involved in the, the, the care of uh, transplant patients, it does also play a, a significant role in the transplant process. Uh, and that's in a few area, areas. Uh, we'll be talking kind of perhaps mostly today about the uh, provincial organ sharing system, the, the oversight that TGLN provides there. Uh, we also have responsibility in developing uh, provincial policies and practices around transplant. And then we, we have uh, a role in performance measurement and public reporting of data. Uh, so to give you a sense of, of how uh, the transplant um, gov of the transplant governance structure in Ontario, uh, you see here uh, this kind of graphic. Uh, the green sections relate to Trillium Gift of Life. We, uh, as I mentioned, come under the umbrella of uh, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. And you see there that uh, there's a, a bunch of committees that kind of feed into the work that we do. We have a, a transplant steering committee, and this is the, the committee which signs off and finalise policy for the province. But under that, there are several working groups which uh, come up uh, with specific policies. And you'll see there there's a, a kidney pancreas working group uh, and that's uh, the, the, the group which I'm most heavily involved in. And it is made up of, of representatives from all of uh, Ontario's kidney transplant programmes. Uh, we meet around three times a year uh, and to discuss different different aspects of transplant policy, from referral policies, uh, look at transplant data, different initiatives to improve transplantation across across the province. Uh, also, in this graphic, you see um, at the, the the left side we there are eight transplant centres uh, in Ontario. And these are listed at the right. We have uh, UHN, London, SickKids, Ottawa Heart Institute, the Ottawa Hospital, St. Michael's, Kingston General, and St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. And only one of those which does not perform uh, kidney transplant is, of course, uh, the Ottawa Heart Institute. And then also at the top here, we, we, have, uh, we have Health Canada there. And uh, many of you probably uh, attended last week's webinar where we, we learned about the kidney pair donation program, which uh, is run by Canadian Blood Services, who also run the, the highly sensitized patient program. Uh, and TGLN obviously have a relationship with, with them and, and links with them to ensure that these programs work as efficiently as possible. Uh, and just to give you a sense of uh, some of the policies which do come out of, of Trillium Gift of Life here, we have uh, the, the kidney transplant uh, referral and listing criteria. This is a, a document which is available on our website um, and it is what is the criteria that each of the transplant 
programs use uh, and uh, referring programs used to determine if a patient should be referred and if they meet the, the criteria for being listed on the wait list. Uh, BJ will talk a little bit more about some of the specifics in that in a, a few minutes. Uh, but that was developed uh, by the, the Kidney Pancreas Working Group with uh, input from all the transplant programs. And it's an attempt to make sure we've got consistent processes across the province so that uh, different hospitals are not doing different things to, to hope that there is a kind of level of uh, consistency there. Uh, and this is a kind of document you see that it's version four. Um, it is getting reviewed uh, at least every couple of years and as needed. So it's a, a kind of living document which uh, we adapt as, as, circumstances, as circumstances change. Uh, and you, you just, again, to give a little bit of a sense, there are obviously documents for other organs there, which you see and all are, as I mentioned, available on our website. So with that, I will uh, pass back to, to BJ. Thank you, Andrew. So I'm um, just going back to the transplant process. I just want to preface uh, the next couple of slides just so that the group knows that these are very specific to what we do here at the University Health Network and the Ajmira Transplant Center. Depending on the transplant program um, you're sort of uh, managing or dealing with at this point in time, uh, the processes may vary. And, and so I just wanted to make sure everyone understands. Um, although we do try to do things as consistently as possible across the transplant centers, um, again, there can be slight variations in terms of the process. So here in front of you, you can see in terms of the different uh, steps um, that are required before a patient is deemed safe to proceed with transplant. And so from referral evaluation to listing, the wait listing period to the actual surgery, again, there are a number of steps, checks and balances to really make sure um, you know, we, we do what's in the best interest of the patient and really what is, in this, um, what is safest for uh, the patients. Um, it is important for, our, uh, for all you to know that patients do not um, need to have started dialysis to be referred to our program. And there is a, a number of patients, about 20% uh, 20, uh, 20 uh, to 30% of the uh, living donor activity that we do see here at our center where we're actually able to uh, provide a transplant before a patient is um, able to, uh, before they start uh, dialysis. Um, in terms of the referral uh, piece, really we have a uh, basically a referral package that we request from our referring centers uh, to be submitted so that we can properly evaluate each patient uh, very uh, carefully. And so there is a number of you know, blood tests, reports, um, baseline history that we request from a patient's uh, primary nephrologist really as the starting point. Um, and really, this may take a patient, once a decision to proceed with transplant is be made by your, your primary kidney team, it can take anywhere from, about, anywhere from about six to eight weeks to get all this testing to us um, before we actually sort of are aware of, um, of your case um, and before we can consider uh, you. And so we do ask the referring centers to really review the guidelines that are provided by TGL TGLN to be able to give us um, sort of an initial screening of whether a patient is, is truly appropriate or would really benefit uh, from a, a transplant and to make sure that there's no active issues that again might need further investigation before we submit the referral. Um, but going down to our website, you can definitely see um, through the UHN transplant website, uh, all of the elements that we ask your referring teams to arrange uh, for you and then send that collateral information to us so that we can register you with our program. Um, sorry. Here, as I was saying, again, there, there can be issues such as severe heart disease, active cancers, um, really things that might make it very difficult um, or make you very high risk to actually proceed with a transplant at this point in time. So TGLN has provided both absolute as well as relative contraindications to transplant. And again, this is uh, basically a guideline for us um, to be able to uh, sort of manage each referral. 
Obviously, when in doubt, we do ask patients and their teams to submit the referral. And our team here will definitely be able to advise whether we think um, it will be safe to proceed with further uh, testing. In terms of the evaluation phase, this needs to be completed before a patient is listed or on the transplant list. Um, sometimes, some of our patients think by in attending our initial education session that they've been put on the transplant list, which is not the case. As I said, there's a number of checks and balances and assessments that need to be had before we can make that decision. Um, so really, we decide uh, through the evaluation whether a patient is safe to proceed. We also look to see if there's any available living donors. Um, I, what I would also recommend is at the time you know that your referral has now been received by our program, this would ideally be the best time for any of your potential living donors to come forward with the completed health history form, okay? Um, sometimes the timing of both the donor um, sort of health questionnaire and the uh, recipient referral package are not timed accordingly. And so we do suggest once a patient has been referred and the referral has been received, that would be the ideal time that your donors come forward so that we can easily link those files together. Um, the evaluation includes a series of tests, which we'll talk about in a little, little bit. Um, and some of that obviously will, will need to be done here at uh, the Toronto General Hospital. But we do try uh, based uh, to, to work with our patients and our referring partners to also do this testing locally so that um, you know, it minimizes the amount of travel uh, to and from our center. In terms of the timing for full assessment, there's about 30% of patients historically who've been sort of gone through the assessment um, and basically activated on the wait list. About 30% of our patients are then waiting three to five years to be able to get their first offer for a deceased from a deceased donor. And they don't have any of sort of possible living donor um, potential opportunities at that point. We know that you are followed by a very competent um, kidney care team. We know that you are followed by a very competent family doctor. You don't need to be followed by a third medical team following the exact same issues. So for those patients we think um, are still uh, uh, you know, about two years away from transplant, um, we will not sort of work you up right away to avoid repeating this testing um, so many times until you get your, your transplant, okay? And so um, we will let you know whether or not we will get you through this process right away versus um, we might hold off. So that again, in terms of the repeat testing, we were trying to avoid that because we know, you know, it takes a lot of time off work, um, you know, parking, things like that. And obviously, if uh, we know this testing will not necessarily provide any clinical benefit to you, because your transplant might be three or five years away, um, we hope to avoid it in your best interest, okay? In terms of the assessment here, we will conduct some additional blood tests really need to confirm your blood type, to get a genetic profile in, in terms of understanding um, really what donors would sort of work better with your system. Um, we will also determine from the pa panel reactive antibody test, are there sort of any pre-existing antibodies that might fight off your kidney um, and cause it to not work as long as we ideally want it to, right? So really our goal here is trying to get you um, a match as quickly as possible and just make sure that kidney lasts as long as possible. Some of the testing we also do is to detect if there's any um, high risk for infections uh, going into transplant. Because as you Im can imagine, if we give you immunosuppression, this can cause infections or cancers to potentially um, get worse and made more complicated. We do a series of tests in terms of x-rays and ultrasounds um, and looking at the blood flow where we hope to connect the kidney as well, really to make sure that there aren't sort of under, any underlying infections or potentially uh, sort of uh, early cancers that again, might be made worse by undergoing a kidney transplant. And then we also assess the blood flow where we hope to connect the kidney to, to make sure that new kidney will get um, really the, the blood supply and the oxygen that it needs to thrive and survive. 
In terms of our processes here at Toronto General, we break up our assessment into in terms of two phases. Again, the first phase, our test and blood work, um, again, some of them need to be done here. Some of them likely can be done at your local uh, referring center. Uh, we, we basically provide a very thorough and comprehensive um, teaching session with one of our clinical coordinators, really to give you an overview of what to expect over the next couple of months. And then from a social worker conversation, we start talking to you about things like drug coverage. Are there going to be any issues with accommodations or transportation, um, things like your living will or power of attorney in the event that something unexpected happens? So we just want to start, you know, um, putting these potential barriers to transplant so that at the time of transplant, you know, you have a plan in place and that we're not scrambling to try to address some of these issues. But really the first uh, milestone assessment is with our transplant nephrologist here. They will look at your referral package and basically um, un give you an understanding of really what your specific risk and benefits are in relation to transplant. Sometimes, uh, and oftentimes, the nephrologist may require some additional uh, testing. If there's a question or a concern that, um, you know, on review that they, they have. Um, sometimes we may need, need to refer you to, for example, a cardiologist or a respirologist or an infectious disease doctor. Okay, so again, there may be more consults once you meet with our team, just to make sure that uh, we're covering all of our bases. If you're stable from a really cardiac point of view and a respiratory point of view, will put you in the queue uh, for the next phase of appointments. Um, and this includes a meeting, one-to-one uh, -one in depth meeting with a social work, really to understand those components that I, I talked to you about earlier, really understand your motivation. Are there any issues with compliance, adherence or addictions that we need a concrete plan uh, prepared? Uh, and, you know, and basically you'll also meet with our anesthesiologist colleagues to review your surgical history, have you had any bad reactions to previous anesthetics? Are there any issues with your airway? And then from our surgical assessment, we'll understand, you know, have you had a lot of abdominal surgeries? Have there been sort of scar tissues that might make this, the, the surgical, surgical uh, incision and, and procedure a little bit more difficult? Is there a preferred side? Do we have to take one of uh, your, your, your uh, native kidneys out before we do the surgery? So that will all be assessed, but it's really those four pillars of the assessment that will actually give us a good sense whether or not you're, you're safe to proceed, okay? And so once you complete all those assessments, once we get all the documentation or, and our questions are answered, you're presented to a committee of uh, professionals, uh, transplant nef nephrologists, surgeons, anesthesiologists, social workers, and nurses, uh, really to make sure, you know, have we, um, have we missed anything? Are there any other questions? Have we all have we got the appropriate documentation? And at this point, uh, basically, we'll determine: um, Are you too early for transplant based on your current renal function? Is a transplant too high risk? Is it too unsafe? Um, are you a candidate for transplant? And uh, you know, in, in terms of a living living donor, so do are we just waiting for that living donor's workup to be completed, or are you a candidate? Um, and don't have a living donor and will be waitlisted on the deceased donor list. And so we'll go through these in the next couple of slides very briefly. So there are a number of patients uh, who, again, once they complete their assessment, might be too early. The timing of transplant for these patients, obviously, you know, is sort of a delicate matter. And so we do essentially, generally, want to make sure that we sort of exhaust all of your, your current renal function right? Get the most out of those kidneys before we proceed with transplant. Reason being, we know it's a high-risk surgery. We know that the immunosuppression and infection risk are, are reality. And so obviously, uh, we do want to make sure that um, we're proceeding uh, when we really need to. Because if uh, you don't need to take these medications, um, you know, uh, we, we don't want you to, to, to take them, right? And so, we typically refer these patients who are to or um, sort of co-manage these patients uh, with your primary nephrologist until we feel that, uh, uh, you know, transplant is really um, the, 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 the only option at this point, okay? And your, your, your primary team will continue uh, to monitor you. Um, as we noted, obviously, ideally, a preemptive transplant is what we are trying to achieve. 
Um, and again, we are trying to avoid the risks uh, associated with dialysis because we know um, it is very stressful on your system, your cardiovascular system. Um, and again, with patients who are seeking a preemptive transplant, it really is important that uh, those patients are referred um, early, okay? Um, another outcome, uh, and this is probably, you know, maybe less than 2% of the total referrals that we see at our center, is that we say a patient is too high risk for transplant. And again, this could be heart disease, lung disease, vascular disease, where there really aren't any other options uh, to be able to optimize you, okay? Um, and unfortunately, um, these patients, uh, you know, we would have a discussion as to why um, we think it's unsafe for you. Um, we do offer uh, to have you refer to our other colleagues and in, in within the province to have sort of another look at your file and we're happy to share your, your file with them to see if they may have another opinion or potentially another approach uh, for them to, for you to be able to proceed uh, with a, a transplant. Otherwise, if transplant is not an option, you would continue on dialysis. Um, in terms of a living donor transplant, so once a, a recipient, a potential recipient, is deemed medically safe to proceed, uh, basically, uh, and you have a potential living donor, uh, if that donor has not yet been approved, we will await that living donor to go through our, our quite rigorous assessment here before um, we, we um, sort of schedule the surgery. Obviously, that donor would need to be found willing and healthy, um, be compatible based on our, our, our testing. Um, and as, as you know uh, from our, our, uh, our program, really, um, you know, donation is really, um, you know, relatively low risk uh, for our healthy donors. Uh, we understand that it has really no significant donation, has no significant impact on a donor's lifespan. OK, um, and there are sort of health considerations that uh, we want all our donors to be aware of um, in terms of uh, understanding the potential future risk um, that uh, might occur. Um, living donor transplant, again, is sort of the, the ideal um, in, in terms of our um, options for transplant. Again, it offers the shortest uh, wait times for transplant. Um, and there's a lot of planning and, and, and sort of uh, preparation that can be done. Um, in this circumstance. And sort of the last slide here uh, is just around deceased donor transplants. Again, if living donation is not an option for our patients, all of our patients will default automatically to the deceased donor transplant list. Um, it's important to know that in the event that a living donor it was to sort of present itself and you were on active on the deceased donor list, we're happy to uh, review that living donor at any time, okay? Um, and so, um, as we'll talk about in, in, in a couple slides uh, coming forward, um, again, it will your wait time on the deceased donor list will depend on a number of factors, including your blood type and dialysis start date. Um, and uh, Andrew will talk uh, very in depth in terms of what it means and what it looks like to be on the deceased uh, donor transplant list. Uh, in terms of time to transplant, in terms of a living donor transplant here at our center, once the donor and the recipient are cleared, we can typically book a surgery within one or two months. So it is quite quick, but it's really that assessment piece, especially on the recipient end, that is really takes the most time. Um, from a deceased donor perspective, typically patients can be waiting anywhere from five to seven years from the start date of dialysis to receive their deceased donor offer, okay? And again, these are specific uh, to our program here at uh, the Ashmira Transplant Program. I'll turn it over to Andrew. Okay, so let's uh, turn our attention to the, uh, to the wait list. And so, so first of all, what, what is the deceased donor wait list? Uh, it's a computerized system. It's managed by Trillium Gift of Life, uh, and it monitors all Ontario patients who are waiting for a deceased donor kidney transplant. Uh, and when a kidney becomes available for transplant, it's used to, to generate a list of recipients to whom the organ can be allocated. And here uh, you, you see a screenshot from uh, our system uh, is training materials. Uh, it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but within this one screen, you can uh, see that there's some demographic information. There's also some high-level 
health information such as blood type and PRA. And uh, there's a little bit of information about the transplant program you see there in this example, we've got TGH. Uh, I apologize, BJ, we've got Michael Garrows listed as the coordinator here. Um, uh, so this is the kind of, kind of information that, that uh, is in the system. And then there's other tabs there which go into kind of go into more, more detail about that. Uh, so some little kind of some stats on, on transplants. So there are around a, a thousand patients, just over a thousand patients currently in Ontario uh, waiting for a deceased donor kidney. And each year we transplant approximately 500 patients and then an additional 500 patients are added to the wait list. So the wait list remains consistently um, around about a thousand. Uh, and we do have some kind of stats on our website. This is another screenshot from it. And you can see that we can break it down by kind of different areas. Uh, here we've got uh, blood type and you can see uh, for kidney that, um, that there's only 55 waiting AD patients waiting for transplants compared to the blood type O, there's 622 currently waiting. Uh, or waiting as of uh, November the 27th. Uh, and we've got some other stats in the website, transplant numbers and things like that. So um, if you're interested, please uh, take a look at that. Uh, so how are organs allocated uh, in Ontario? Uh, so first of all, there, it, it's a two kind of stage process. Uh, first of all, we have to, to match uh, the donors. And then once they're matched, we have to, uh, uh, recipients are prioritized uh, and we'll go through uh, that process. So for, for matching, um, for example, we have to ensure that the, the blood type is compatible. Uh, here you the little table showing the, the blood types which are uh, compatible. So if you're uh, a recipient, if you, your blood type is A, you can receive from an A and an O donor. Um, and etc. Uh, in addition to, to blood type, um, we kind of evaluate your um, what's called uh, CPRA, and it's essentially uh, it's a kind of it determines how sensitized your immune system is, and it, to get a sense of uh, how likely you are to reject an organ. Uh, from a donor, so it's, it's related to your antibodies, which are compared with a donor to yours. Uh, and essentially those that have a high CPRA um, are harder to, harder to match uh, with those with uh, a lower CPRA. Uh, and then there's other considerations that go into matching, uh, such as uh, your height or weight. So for example, uh, a pediatric patient with, wouldn't recipient wouldn't uh, perhaps receive a an organ from a from an older or perhaps heavier or larger uh, donor. Uh, so once uh, what once we uh, are a match, we then have a, a system of uh, prioritization. And first of all, uh, there are uh, categories here. Uh, and this is this is an example of taking from our, our policies. Uh, and here we see uh, the, the first kind of set, the first category is for medically urgent candidates. So they're they're, they're patients that are uh, that are kind of deemed as a special committee that looks at this uh, if their health is in a high risk and uh, they would. The, the, it's decided that they urgently need a transplant. So they, they would be the ones that would then be matched first. Uh, we also then were trying to match with the HSP here. So they're patients with the high, very high CPRAs. So they're harder to match. So we try to give them a boost uh, in the matching because we know it's hard to match. So if a match comes up, we try to give it to them before people that are easier to match. Uh, you can also see here, that if you have a, you know, a previous living donor, you are given a priority of recognition that um, you have, um, I guess, taken some risks by, uh, by being a donor and uh, uh, by, by that gift uh, that they feel it's appropriate that 
uh, we should try to kind of uh, accelerate the time or lessen the amount of time that you are uh, waiting for your own transplant. And then we kind of go down all these uh, kind of different uh, categories. So then within each of these categories, and I apologize, this, this is complicated, but we, we can make, uh, we go to a lot of lengths to ensure that the system, uh, we, we try to balance, uh, so equitable for people, um, uh, but also we, we try to balance that with utility as well. So uh, we're trying to ensure that um, we maximize organs and that we kind of get the best, uh, the longest life out of them as well. Uh, so within each of those categories, you then have a, a kind of a ranking within that, and each uh, patient, each recipient is given allocation points. Now, allocation points are uh, calculated using two factors. Uh, one is your time of dialysis, so the number of days uh, a patient has been on dialysis, and then you can get you also get points for uh, sensitivity. Uh, which is your, your CPR A score. Um, so the formulas that we use is here. So for every 30 days you've been in dialysis, you get 0.1 point. Uh, and then the CPR A value, which is, is based on uh, blood tests, is divided by 100 and then um, multiplied by four. And then those numbers are, are added together. So an example here is that, that John has been in dialysis for five years. Um, oh, and I, I've changed the, the, the gender of this person um, in the example. So uh, in this case, he or she has spent a total of 60 months on dialysis uh, and their PRA is 12%. So this, this patient would, um, for their 60 months uh, on dialysis, would get six points. And then for the PRA, they get an additional uh, 0.48 points, meaning they have a total of 6.48 points. So if patients are equal within those uh, categories I previously showed you, it would depend who's got the highest points would uh, receive the, the offer. Uh, now, when patients are on the wait list, you have a, a medical status and, and this uh, can change uh, depending on your, your health. So if a patient's health deteriorates and it's decided that uh, they temporarily cannot uh, receive, a, uh, receive a transplant, they'll be placed on hold. Also, um, there, there can be other factors, maybe um, a patient is on vacation or something like that, so um, they can go on hold for things like that, which uh, essentially means that they'll not receive a, an offer uh, during that time. However, importantly, even if you are on hold, you still continue to accumulate allocation points. As I mentioned previously, that's based on your dialysis start date. And then it's only if a patient's on hold goes beyond 120 days without having, uh, without having that status reviewed, that um, the patient would be considered to be suspended uh, from the waitlist and you stop uh, receiving points. However, um, transplant teams uh, and TGLN do kind of monitor these statuses to uh, to make sure that, that nobody is uh, incorrectly uh, suspended or people that should be uh, lifted from on hold are, are done. So, and transplant programs will uh, generally keep patients informed of that if, if they, they need to, to know that. Uh, and then another factor which uh, could influence or does influence wait time is around what we call extended criteria donors. So these are our kidneys which come from uh, donors um, which uh, are, are considered, they may come from older donors uh, and they probably wouldn't last as long as a, an organ from a younger donor, but they're still deemed to be uh, suitable for transplant. Uh, and because uh, because of they don't have the same longevity, uh, we have criteria about who can receive these. And the criteria uh, uh, listed here, so over the age of 60 or over the age of 50 with diabetes or, or those with other significant health conditions, they could be eligible. Now, that's a, a conversation that um, a patient would have with a transplant program. 
Uh, and if you are listed as being eligible for ECD, you're still uh, eligible for any other uh, donors as well. And the advantage of becoming, of, of saying you're willing to accept an ECD donor is patients uh, typically have shorter wait times. Uh, there's a, a smaller pool of people uh, waiting for them. And um, it's, it's, it's a way to, to hopefully be on dialysis for uh, less time. Uh, so the big question that, that everybody obviously wants to know is how, how long will you be in the wait list? Um, as previously mentioned, wait time is, is counted from dialysis start date as opposed to when you're listed or when you're referred. Um, uh, and unfortunately, it is, it's, it's impossible to know exactly how long you're going to wait. I, I think I'll hopefully be able to show you that there's a lot of variables that go into the, the matching process and also the, um, the prioritization process. Uh, process. So it's impossible to know exactly how long people wait. Uh, as I mentioned there, ECD patient uh, recipients tend to wait a, a little bit less time. Uh, so the wait times, one thing that we can do is provide estimates on uh, based on previous transplants. So the data you, you see here is based on two years worth of data, so the past two years. And this is an average of how long uh, patients by blood type wait. So a blood type A transplant patients are an average waiting 4.2 years. Unfortunately, what this doesn't do is take into consideration the, and I think BJ kind of uh, gave a range of years for how long people are waiting. And this is, it's questionable how useful this is because some people are waiting fairly short terms where the higher PRA patients, for example, could be waiting many years. So this average is just that, but uh, it's perhaps not particularly useful to uh, as a gauge for that. But uh, I say, hopefully, hopefully, um, I understand that it's a frustrating and it seems a bit of a mystery of what happens once you go on the wait list. Um, I, I hope this kind of uh, reassures people that there are a lot of effort goes into make sure it is fair and equitable um, and we can do our best to, to obviously keep these as short as possible, and but if it is fair and equitable. I'll pass back to Paula, I believe now. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, thank you both for that um, a very, very comprehensive presentation on the wait list and referral. Um, and assessment processes. Um, we now have Brian Cook, who um, is, uh, uh, has devoted his life to community service and continues to do that after retirement. Um, and uh, he's also a living kidney donor and uh, will be sharing his story with you today. So, Brian. Well, thank, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I thank you all. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Brian. And I donated, donated my kidney to my niece, Allison, over three and a half years ago. My niece, Allison, who was, a four, was 40 years old at this time and had been a child diabetic since she was three years old. As a result of her diabetes, it had taken a toll on her body. Both Allison's kidneys were now failing and shutting down to the point now, she was receiving kidney dialysis 24 seven. Allison's daily life now was being hooked to a, a dialysis machine. It was difficult to watch. Allison had been on the transplant list for two years now, and there was no indication she would be receiving a transplant anytime soon. In December of 2015, Allison approached me and asked if I would consider donating my kidney to her. She had learned that people of, of my age at 64 years old and, and being in good health could possibly be an eligible donor. I was really surprised when she told me that I could be a potential donor. I never thought I could be as I thought you had to be younger to be a potential donor. 
I felt the need to move forward with this pre-donor testing, if I could help Allison. And at this time, I really received a lot of support from my family, my wife, my daughter, and my brother and his wife. It, it just, uh, it, it really was very supportive and, and made me feel at peace to be able to move forward at this time. In January of 2016, I contacted the transplant clinic, <clears throat> excuse me, at St. Joe's Healthcare Center in Hamilton where my niece was registered waiting for a kidney transplant. Months went by and I had not heard anything from the transplant clinic. As you've heard previously from Andrew and, and BJ, at that time, not knowing the whole procedure of being a potential donor for my niece, it was frustrating to me as I was continuing to see my niece's health deteriorate. Finally, in May, the process was beginning to start with all the testing to see if I could be a potential donor. Over the next number of months, between May and November, I made 12 trips to the hospital for intensive training or for intensive testing. On November the 10th, I completed the pre op assessment and I was cleared for surgery. I was a perfect match for my niece. This, and how I'll just explain why I was such a perfect match. My brother and I are twins, and this was my brother's daughter. And, and the doctors were just so amazed to see how perfect the match. It, uh, it was joking at the times they thought I was, I was the father, not my brother because of the perfect match. And so surgery day was November 16th. On this day, as I was being wheeled in for surgery, my surgery was postponed as my, my niece had gone into heart arrhythmia due to her kidney failure and the operation was canceled. To say the least, this was very disappointing for me, my niece, to Allison's parents, who had been waiting for so long for this transplant. Well, Allison did somewhat recover from her heart arrhythmia, making it possible for the transplant to occur. On December 21st, the surgery took place. All went well for both Allison and me. I was sent home from the hospital two days later. Before leaving the hospital, I was able to see Allison. To see this change in this young lady was an absolute miracle. The color now in her face and how upbeat she was so quickly after this transplant. It should be noted also that Allison was able to go home from the hospital on Christmas day too. Shortly after Allison received her kidney, she was placed on the pancreas transplant list. After a year after, a year after receiving her kidney, she received a pancreas transplant. My niece Allison now is diabetes free, living a full and active life. And the only little things that she had, it was complications was the anti-rejection drugs that people after receiving transplant receive. But now they've been able to regulate all those and she's doing very well. For myself, my recovery, I have been able to live a normal active life with one kidney. My only experience after surgery is a, was a lot of discomfort from the gas pain from, this, from the surgery, making it difficult to sleep and relax at times from this pain, which lasted for about five days for me, but it dissipated out of my body. And also at that time, I lacked energy, from the surgery, but within two weeks, I was feeling normal again. And within three months, I was able to return to my part-time job. Ever since donating, I, uh, ever since donating, I, I attend the renal kidney clinic for my annual checkup. My test results have been excellent, living with one kidney. My creatinine levels 
are only at 120, and which is very good. And so it's been amazing there too. And after donating my kidney, I became a volunteer at the kidney clinic in my area. I volunteer my time to be a support and encouragement to others going through the pre-donor and pre-recipient process and also being a support to the nurses and the doctors in the clinical kidney clinic. During my experience though, going through this pre-donor process, I brought my thoughts and suggestions to the kidney clinic to the need to change the lengthy testing process from approximately 14 traveling visits to the hospital to a more efficient testing process, meaning less visits to the hospital and traveling time time off work for a donor, which also possibly, and which would also possibly result in the recipient possibly receiving a donated kidney sooner. As a result of this suggestion, the support by the kidney clinic team in my area, one donor clinic has been formed and making it more convenient to do these testings for pre donors, having only five visits now, which allows for a quicker decisions by the living donor team and the recipient receiving a kidney sooner. Being a living donor can save lives. And it can be, you can be of any age. Being able to tell my story, I hope to, will be a hope to others to become involved in this living donation process. I thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. That was, um, really, really helpful. I, I think it's important for our audience to know that um, there is a very uh, comprehensive assessment process for, for donors. Um, and, uh, you know, and there are some unexpected things that happen for recipients as well. And that happened in, in your case. And uh, thankfully, everyone is well. Um, and you are going to be celebrating uh, a kidniversary very soon. <laughs> Um, I'm mindful of time. Um, maybe I could ask uh, Courtney Mart, who uh, uh, handles our um, uh, um, communications, to put up some of the questions that we've received on slido.com. Um, we know that we won't be able to address um, uh, more uh, questions than perhaps just uh, the, the first few that, that you see. Um, but uh, we, because you sent a lot of those questions in advance, we um, hope that we've been able to answer most of them. Um, so uh, maybe the first question, um, BJ, uh, can go to you. Uh, if someone has COVID or had COVID, I should say, can they still donate a kidney? Yeah. Um, so in terms of this uh, question, um, I understand that obviously going through the thorough assessment and the fact that uh, COVID is relatively new in terms of, again, the last year, what we've been doing. Um, obviously, um, I would always recommend that you do not rule out your own donor or being a donor in the event that you do have COVID as part of your, your medical history. Obviously, anybody with active infections, we typically try to um, defer um, assessment. Um, but obviously, we'll, the more conversations will need to be had. So instead of um, saying, uh, you know, potentially uh, eliminating a potential uh, possibility for uh, donation, I would say, uh, please continue to connect with whichever uh, donor uh, uh, center uh, you would like to be assessed by and have that team make sort of the decision as to whether or not uh, you would be a suitable candidate. Um, and and that, that'll probably be the best course of action. Um, again, you do not want to rule yourself out or eliminate a chance uh, that could have happened um, because, of, because of this, okay? Thank you. Um, the next question is a question that I, um, that we may take on in a, a future session, a future webinar where we talk about research and work underway at UHN and elsewhere. Um, uh, BJ, is there anything that you would like to um, comment on with respect to development of artificial de devices for kidney treatment? Um, yeah, so uh, what I would say here is, uh, you know, uh, like at this point in time, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the development of artificial kidneys and a petri dish or, or trying to grow organs and things like that or develop a, a portable dialysis machine, right now, um, those options um, don't are not currently widely available for our patients. So, and so 
they do not influence sort of how we manage patients at this point in time because either dialysis or a kidney transplant are really the, the main two medical options at this time to manage medically um, and surgically um, end stage kidney disease, right? So it's currently, these options are great and I'm glad that everyone is exploring this and, and those fields are definitely advancing, um, but uh, that has not impact uh, the work we're currently doing um, at our center. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. And we will be um, uh, addressing some of these topics in the new year with a whole series uh, related to uh, research and innovation in uh, kidney transplant and uh, management of kidney disease. Um, this next one relates to the average age of a kidney donor. We've already heard that older donors uh, can donate. Um, uh, BJ, what is uh, the average age, and potentially even Andrew, um, uh, what is the average age of a kidney donor, um, and uh, uh, what is commonly the, the, the state? Oops. <laughs> I, don't uh, I, I don't have a specific age for you. I can say that uh, the majority of donors are between 35 and 59. Uh, about 60% of donors are in that category. Obviously, um, through Brian's example, we, we know that donors can be uh, older than that. So we do get them into their 70s, I believe. And then obviously, in some cases, there's very young donors, but 35 to, to around 60 is the kind of the majority. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. And uh, I guess we are now at time. Um, so there are quite a few questions. Again, thank you for those questions. We will endeavor to address them potentially through a follow-up document that we will be sending out to everybody who's registered. Um, I'd also like to invite you to view the session, the webinar that we um, hosted uh, um, earlier in the week or, or earlier in, in last month. Um, to which looked at pair kidney uh, donations. So that event is also uh, available on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you'd like more information on uh, on uh, the transplant wait list uh, you can, um, and the kidney transplant program um, at the Ashmera Transplant Center, here are the websites to go to. Uh, certainly, we would welcome uh, your questions as well. Uh, feel free to connect with the Center for Living or Organ Donation if you have a question related to uh, finding a living donor, um, related to um, living donation um, overall. Etc. And obviously, you will also be receiving some of that information from your respective uh, transplant centers, including um, the Ashmera Transplant Center. Um, I would like to take um, an opportunity to thank our speakers today. Uh, they provided a very, very comprehensive uh, uh, overview of uh, as the assessment referral um, and um, waitlist criteria. Uh, you will be able to. Uh, access a recording of this, um, this session on our YouTube channel. And um, we look forward to um, connecting with you in the, in, at our next session, which is next week, where we'll be looking at um, uh, physical activity for transplant recipients and living donors. We know that being physically healthy is very, very important pre-transplant and in order to be eligible to donate an organ. Um, and post-transplant and post-surgery, it's also very important to uh, regain physical strength, um, um, uh, and uh, to ensure that uh, you're continuing to live a healthy life uh, because that is the reason why we um, talk about transplant to get you back to, to give you your life back. Um, and so we will be talking about uh, physical activity. Uh, and again, in the new year, join us for uh, more sessions we'll, where we'll be uh, exploring these topical issues. So thank you to our speakers and thank you to all of you for joining us today.